Well, this next talk by Dr. Stephen Barros, titled Sound Money in Society, Could Cryptocurrency Make a Difference, is uh, very apropos right now. So Dr. Barros is Chief Operating Officer at the Acton Institute. He's here to walk us through the form and judicial structure of the monetary system and the consequences of monetary disruptions, how cryptocurrencies could usher in the next stage in global monetary systems, how distributed ledger technology and a tokenized economy might benefit both the church and society at large. And let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Barrows. He's the former executive vice president and provost of Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, where he was a tenured associate professor of economics. He has served 21 years in the Air Force as an acquisition officer and economics professor at the United States Air Force Academy and a faculty mentor at the National Military Academy of Afghanistan. Graduated the Air Force Academy with distinction. He holds a bachelor's and master's, uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Penn State, as well as a PhD in economics from Auburn University, home of the Mises Institute. I had a child that graduated Auburn as well and converted to Catholicism as did his wife, Kimberly, they, uh, the couple have three sons and two daughters. So please, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Barros for his service and please welcome me in joining Dr. Stephen Barros. Thank you, Lorraine. And I'd like to also thank Matt Pinto for the vision and in establishing this conference and also then for inviting me to speak. And thank you also for joining me for this talk today. And as Lorraine said, uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Acton Institute, uh, where our mission is to promote a free and virtuous society uh, characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. So like many, I have been fascinated by the ups and downs of uh, the market for cryptocurrencies, and I've asked myself whether or not cryptocurrencies generally, and Bitcoin specifically, are mere fads or something more substantive. And so I began to investigate the nature of cryptocurrencies and their economic implications. Furthermore, as a Catholic and an economist, I'm keenly interested in examining this new technology through the lens of Catholic social teaching. So today, I would like to provide an overview of the potential implications of this new technology for global monetary systems and how we might understand this through a Catholic lens. While I'm convinced that there is, the underlying technology has enormous potential for practical and beneficial uses, I also think that the potential pathways for the technology and for global monetary systems is less clear. Indeed, the technology is moving faster than the institutional and legal framework necessary to circumscribe cryptocurrency's utility in service of humanity. And this, I think, is the chief challenge that cryptocurrency faces. My talk will essentially be broken down into four parts. First, I will provide a basic overview of monetary concepts and definitions. Second, I will elaborate on the evolution of money in society and the institutional framework regulating the production and use of money. Third, I will elaborate on what Catholic social teaching has to say about sound money as it pertains to human flourishing. And fourth, I'll outline what I foresee are the various pathways cryptocurrency could take in the broader landscape of monetary systems and how one might judge these pathways through a Catholic lens. So after wrapping up the talk, I'd be happy to engage in Q&A and also I have a list of recommended readings that I can provide to you in a handout if you're curious. Again, I, I think I have 30 minutes for this talk and then about 10 minutes for Q&A. So let me begin with a few basic concepts underlying money, broadly speaking, before I delve into cryptocurrencies specifically. And of course, it's helpful to ask, what is money? Well, the simplest definition, and the one that I prefer, is that money is the most liquid or most marketable of all commodities. As you probably already know, money has three chief characteristics. First, it's a medium of exchange. Because money is the most liquid or marketable commodity, it can be traded for virtually anything and enables societies to avoid the cumbersome alternative of barter. Second, money serves as a unit of account. Now this 
underappreciated characteristic enables the market price system to function. And it is this price system which serves as the very foundation for a free economy because it enables a highly efficient means of communicating information about the relative scarcity of goods and services. And third, money is a store of value, which enables individuals to trade through time. It is this characteristic which is the first to buckle under an unsound monetary regime, as, for example, in the case of hyperinflation. So then, these are the three chief characteristics of money, a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. These characteristics facilitate the exchange of goods and services in the marketplace, the ability uh, to use one's gifts and talents to create, and the ability of entrepreneurs to innovate, all in the service of civil society. Therefore, sound money is an essential, if often taken for granted, element of human flourishing. Let me now contextualize money historically. Money has assumed various forms throughout history, and the institutions which have regulated these forms and their use have evolved as well. In its earliest forms, shells, stones, and beads facilitated exchange, and eventually, these less durable and less homogeneous forms of money gave way to precious metals, which were eventually coined and became the dominant money in society. Modern coins and currency, or what we often refer to as cash, are perhaps the most obvious form of money today. Now, historically, currency was backed by precious metals, and coins were circulated in the undiluted form of that precious metal. For many years, the United States operated under bimetallism, using both gold and silver coinage as legal payment for debts. Then, in 1873, the United States ended free coinage of silver dollars and gold dominated thereafter. The United States was on a monometallic standard until 1933, when President Roosevelt no longer permitted private citizens to hold gold coins and bullion. Now, the Bretton Woods arrangement in the 1940s ensured that the United States dollar would displace the British pound as the world's premier and dominant currency, with foreign currencies exchangeable for the dollar and the dollar itself redeemable for gold. Then in 1971, President Nixon completely detached the U.S. currency from gold, no longer honoring the commitment to foreign countries to redeem dollars for gold. Thus, the United States has had a pure fiat money system ever since, which is to say, Today's cash is money that is declared so by the government and is legal tender issued by central banks for transactions and is only backed by faith in the government that issues it. But notably, as I'm sure you're aware, the use of cash is declining dramatically as a percentage of all forms of money used in exchange. Cash is being crowded out by electronic or digital forms of money. So let's turn then to this concept of digital money. We can refer to digital forms of money, broadly speaking, as digital currency. The Financial Action Task Force, an intergovernmental body that seeks to prevent money laundering and terrorism finance, points out that digital currency can be further broken down into two kinds. First, e-money, which is simply a digital representation of fiat money with legal tender status, and two, virtual currency, which is also a digital representation of money that does not have legal tender status, such as a private form of money that could be traded for goods and services. Now, a central bank digital currency, or CBDC, is one potential form of e-money, since it would, of course, have legal tender status. By contrast, Bitcoin is one specific type of virtual currency. It is, of course, what we call a cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrencies currently have no legal tender status in most international jurisdictions. In other words, nobody is obligated to take payment in a cryptocurrency. 
Now, the most important aspect of cryptocurrency for purposes of my talk is its cryptographically secured, decentralized form. What makes Bitcoin a potentially revolutionary development in the history of money as opposed to merely an evolutionary one is its underlying blockchain technology, which is one specific form of an innovation we know as distributed ledger technology, or DLT. DLT, I think, has triggered a new phase of financial innovation and is transforming the way we think about monetary systems. So then, in summary, digital currencies can be broken down into two types, e-money and virtual currency, and a cryptocurrency's decentralized characteristic is one of its most important features. So with these definitions in mind, let's now examine the implications of DLT. While the cryptocurrency craze is certainly plagued by rampant speculation, we should step back from the hype and consider the transformational potential underlying the technology, again known as distributed ledger technology. DLT has implications for any form of digital currency, and more importantly, yields the major benefit of improved trusts in digital transactions. Now, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority describes DLT in this way. It's, quote, a distributed database maintained over a network of computers connected on a peer-to-peer -peer basis where participants can share and retain identical cryptographically secured records in a decentralized manner, end quote. DLT comes in various forms, such as blockchain, as you're aware, directed acyclic graph or hash graph. And while the technology is still evolving, its breakthrough is decentralized consensus in exchange. In other words, DLT enables a new kind of trust. Now, the current digital exchange process can be costly and must go through several conceptual steps, including the submission of the payment, validation of the identity of the payer, conditional acceptance of payment by verifying that there are sufficient funds, and final settlement, settlement with updated account balances. Now, this payment clearing and settlement process is necessary, of course, because of the need to ensure that transactions are accurate and error-free. If you're spending directly from your checking account, you must be assured to avoid double spending or overdrawing your account. Now, you can't double spend cash because you have to physically hand over your cash. But historically, we have needed third party, a third party mechanism with digital currency to verify that there is no double spending by effectively keeping a centralized ledger. DLT bypasses centralization and could dramatically reduce the cost of verification through its distributed network and cryptographic techniques. And this could have significant implications for a sound and stable monetary system. So with that, let's now turn to what Christian tradition has to say about sound money. Of course, Christian tradition does concern itself with money, as we heard from uh, Father Pinsent. One cannot read through scripture without noticing how often it addresses the topic of money. We know that the scriptures refer to various dimensions of it, often within the context of temptations that accompany wealth. Our Lord warns us that we cannot serve both God and mammon. About one-third of Jesus' parables reference money in some fashion. In his first epistle to Timothy, the Apostle Paul cautions that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But more specifically, Scripture teaches the importance of justice in exchange. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 35 to 36 states, quote, You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hin. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, end quote. If a coin, then, is designated a certain weight, it should not be clipped or you defraud the recipient. If it's declared a certain degree of purity, it would be illicit to dilute that content. The late scholastics reaffirmed the importance of sound money. For example, 
Tomas de Mercado and Juan de Mariana, among others, criticized monetary debasement as immoral. One temptation of a fiat monetary system is for governments to pay their bills through the use of the printing press. Such coordination between the government and the central bank can cause monetary instability, particularly inflation. Unstable money harms the poor and vulnerable the most, which is to say, the poor are unable to adapt as easily as the wealthy are to monetary disruptions. Because money is such a vital element of a flourishing society, it is important that it retain its inherent characteristics. And the third characteristic, its store of value function, is one of the most threatened by a government monopolized fiat monetary system. Government's deliberate attempt to devalue a nation's currency through inflation disrupts that function and harms the property of others. As Dylan Pahman and Alexander Salter conclude in a recent article entitled Theft by Inflation, quote, while the form of money has changed greatly since ancient times, the principles that govern its proper stewardship have not. We still need a perfect ju and just weight today. In the United States, Federal Reserve policy would not pass the test of the refiner's fire, nor would the dollar, for that matter. The costs of money mischief disproportionately fall on those who have the hardest time bearing them. This is a major social injustice, end quote. Now, Christian tradition is thus critical of deliberate debasement of money. A currency must be relatively stable. Unsound money undermines other ethical principles found in Catholic social teaching, which I turn to next. The corpus of modern Catholic social teaching emphasizes several principles that bear directly upon economic matters, the most important being that economic activity must be at the service of the human person. In order for an economy to do so, property rights must be defended as a natural right of the per person. Pope Leo XIII firmly declared this in his 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum, and I quote from that, he states, the first and most fundamental principle, therefore, if one would undertake to alleviate the condition of the masses, must be the inviolability of private property, end quote. Pope Pius XI reiterated this truth in his 1931 encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, as did St. John Paul II in his 1991 encyclical Centesimus Annus. Alongside this natural right to private property, the church teaches the universal destination of the goods of the earth. We are to use our private property in service to others. Pope Francis reminds us, that, uh, reminds us of this in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, namely that the right to private property is a secondary natural right, which is oriented towards serving others. Although Catholic social teaching cannot authoritatively recommend particular monetary systems, the soundness or unsoundness of a particular form of money can be judged, at least in part, on the basis of, of whether or not it defrauds the property of others through state-induced debasement. Indeed, as St. John Paul II notes in Centissimus Annus, a market eco economy actually presupposes a stable currency. In Caritas in Veritate, Pope Benedict XVI insisted that the experience of the great financial crisis of 2007-2008 compels us to re-examine economic systems for the sake of human well-being. And most recently, Pope Francis reiterated this point in Fratelli Tutti, indicating that financial leaders did not adequately respond to the great financial crisis with effective reform proposals and are in fact obligated to do so. What is so insidious about unsound forms of money is that they often defraud some persons of their property through inflation. And what is so dangerous about unstable monetary systems in general is that they can involuntarily transfer property from one group to another in the form of bailouts. In light of these teachings, it is appropriate to ask, can cryptocurrency facilitate a more sound form of money um, which fosters a free economy oriented towards human flourishing 
And I think the answer to that question is a conditional yes. The three most important conditions are one, that cryptocurrency be buttressed the natural right to private property, that it facilitate a stable currency, and three, that, the per that it keeps the person at the center of the economy, particularly the least among us. So what does this mean for the future of money and monetary systems going forward? Well, let me propose four potential pathways. The first pathway is what I'll call a maximalist application of cryptocurrency, leading to the denationalization of money and permitting a pure laissez-faire market-based form of money to develop and pervade global commercial transactions. Now, some early advocates for Bitcoin saw the innovation as a kind of anarcho-capitalist project where national currencies are made irrelevant. I don't think this pathway is particularly viable because Bitcoin shows no evidence of obtaining the status of a safe haven currency yet. As Cornell University economist Eswar Prasad notes, safe haven currencies are characterized by both their enormous depth and ubiquitous liquidity, which is to say there is a large quantity of assets denominated in that currency, and it's possible to easily trade in that currency. And at the present time, it, this doesn't appear likely for Bitcoin. <clears throat> but even more importantly, nation states have no incentive to, dis to dispense with one extraordinarily important aspect of national sovereignty. That, of course, is a country's monetary policy. For the United States in particular, this would arguably be an abdication of Congress's constitutional power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. But either way, the U.S. has no incentive to allow the dollar to lose its status as the world's reserve currency. Which then leads me to a second potential pathway, which is for nation states to ban cryptocurrency or cripple it through the absence of a legal framework to define and circumscribe its use. An example of the former is Algeria banning crypto or China highly restricting it. Now, an example of the latter is the demise of Facebook's or Meta's Libra project, subsequently designated the DN DM Association. Now, with a global network of approximately 3 billion users and a platform to serve as the basis of a comprehens comprehensive digital marketplace, there is no economic reason why the DM Association project could not result in a private currency issued by Facebook. Indeed, there are no laws of economics which preclude private forms of money from arising in the marketplace. In fact, that's how money began. But in order to do so, there needs to be a clear legal framework in which to operate. And unfortunately for the DM Association, or fortunately, is, depending on your opinion, uh, no such legal framework ever materialized, and they abandoned the project, citing the fact that, quote, it nevertheless became clear from our dialogue with federal regulators that the project could not move ahead, end quote. Thus, the state, through its power, could simply outlaw cryptocurrencies or, through its willful neglect, trigger their demise through an inadequate juridical and institutional framework. Now to the third pathway. The third pathway is what I might call a modern-day equivalent of the Bretton Woods system, or what we might refer to as Bretton Woods 2.0. Now, what would this entail? This pathway would seek to establish global rules for a new form of money that leverages the benefits of dig distributed ledger technology with a framework for securing a digital gold standard. There are benefits, costs, and risks to this third approach. The chief benefit of Bretton Woods 2.0 is that it would bring clarity to cryptocurrency's role in the global financial system. Some features of this pro approach might entail a set of institutional arrangements whereby national currencies or even a global currency is anchored to digital gold. For example, Bitcoin with its algorithmically limited maximum supply could serve as that potential anchor, opening the door to fixed exchange rates and more stable international capital flows. This cryptocurrency path to financial reform echoes the debates of defenders of the free market during the demise of the Bretton Woods system. Let me here quote from Ben Stiles' excellent book, 
the Battle of Bretton Woods. Stiles states, quote, supporters of Milton Friedman would argue that attempts to fix bilateral exchange rates under a fiat monetary system with no gold anchor do far more economic harm. Both Friedman and Hayek despaired over the stagflation, that is low growth and high inflation, that overtook the world in the 1970s. Yet whereas Friedman blamed central banks for not restraining the growth of the money supply, Hayek argued that such indiscipline was inevitable when governments were unfettered by the sort of hard external constraints imposed by the gold standard. In 1976, he came out in favor of replacing monopoly central banks with competitive private currency issuers." End quote. An additional benefit to this third pathway is reducing the cost, or indeed enormous opportunity cost, of the global foreign exchange market which has arisen to facilitate international capital flows and hedge against foreign exchange risk. Safadine Amos points out that as of 2016, quote, the foreign exchange market is around 25 times as large as all the economic production that takes place in the entire planet, end quote. A gigantic global industry, therefore, has developed to accommodate and mitigate the risks accompanying uh, capital flows under a pure fiat monetary system. But I will note there is one major downside to this third pathway, a serious danger that it become a globalist project which insufficiently respects human freedom and privacy and could be weaponized by the state at the expense of a free civil society. Catholics should be very wary of the amplification of state power that a central bank digital currency could entail for states not friendly toward the church. The fourth and final pathway is what I will call competition in cryptocurrency payment networks. So this would be a situation that would be facilitated by a clear regular, regulatory framework which does not favor any particular distributed ledger technology or digital coin and which allows the marketplace to develop privately intermediated payment systems. These systems would be allowed to compete with each other. They could compete on the basis of their resiliency and stability, their ability to secure user privacy, their facilitating access to the unbanked, and their facilitating cross-border payments. As Prasad points out, quote, competition between various forms of privately created money and central bank money in their roles as mediums of exchange will intensify. Network effects might well become even stronger if market forces are left to themselves, enabling some issuers of money and providers of payment technologies to become dominant, end quote. What is needed to facilitate this is not a globalist Bretton Woods 2.0, but rather a clear and unwieldy regulatory framework. I think the U.S. in particular needs to determine which regulatory agency should take the lead in overseeing the rules of the game for cryptocurrency innovation. Free markets and competition are best at facilitating innovation, but not when there's a legal vacuum. Competition could yield a digital money network anchored in a limited supply asset, which is not prone to central bank temptations to debase its currency. Competition could also help mitigate the risks associated with a state monetary monopoly. Central bank digital currencies bring with them all the dangers we are already seeing in China, <coughs> a tool of the state to engage in social engineering and control. Monetary uh, competition could also safeguard the Catholic Church from coercion through cutting the Vatican off from glo the global financial marketplace. Indeed, this is exactly what happened when the Bank of Italy cut the Vatican off temporarily at the beginning of 2013. So through competition, the innovations in cryptocurrency could lead to an ideal reform in global monetary systems, which ultimately facilitate monetary stability, provide access to the global economy for the unbanked, and enable trust in exchange. So now in conclusion, Irrespective of the above pathways and which one may prevail, distributed ledger technology has applications beyond just a sound money project. And I, in fact, look forward to sitting in some of the sessions to learning about some of those projects here at the conference. 
Now, a few projects I hope that Catholics will pursue along these lines include how DLT and decentralized organizations could mitigate the risks of being canceled by big tech, how the church could use blockchain technology to certify official Vatican documents are authentic and not distorted by hostile actors, and how we might even document sacramental records using blockchain technology. I'm optimistic that cryptocurrency and its underlying technology could spark a reform in global monetary systems centered on the well-being of humanity. Modern history has seen periods of both monetary stability and disruption. The most recent financial crisis of 2007-2008 highlighted how fragile the current system can be. The recent return of dollar inflation reminds us that unsound money robs us of the fruits of our labor. The advent of cryptocurrencies have opened the door to new forms of money, currency competition, and possible avenues for reform. None of these are without risk, of course. But borrowing from the words of St. John Paul II, what is needed, I think, is innovation and competition which is, quote, circumscribed within a strong juridical framework which places it at the service of human freedom in its totality, end quote. Only in this way can we develop a more sound form of money and monetary systems which serve human flourishing. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Um, if anybody has a question, well, let me ask who has the first question. I'll bring the mic over so everybody can hear it. I think that would be a little bit easier. So in, in the time-honored traditional uh, principle of first, um, uh, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. <laughs> um, it would seem that Bitcoin has positioned itself to, um, and in cryptocurrency in general, through the Bitcoin vortex that come, I don't know if you're familiar with that principle, but it's positioned itself in such a way that governments that fail to adopt crypto or adopt Bitcoin in particular will be left behind. Um, and just like the internet, if, if people try to turn their back on the innovation and the opportunities that the internet afforded them, any business that said, oh, well, that's just too much or that's impossible or what's the use? It's always done, been done this way. Um, they would they got left behind mm -hmm. so in the same way it's, it would seem to me that the fifth path of the, the four that you mentioned would be that uh, Bitcoin continues to impose itself and uh, and other cryptocurrencies and governments are just have to get behind uh, otherwise they'll left be left behind and uh, and fail yes I, I would almost call that a, a version 4b so that currency competition is going to continue that the technology is out there I don't think it's particularly realistic, either the first or the second uh, options or pathways ahead, especially the second one, because granted, you could have you know, universal banning of cryptocurrencies, and that would just push it underground, and I think there would be the inevitability of people just using different means of paying for things, and, uh, and while there'd be... I'm saying that there'd be you'd never stand up Th That's right. So, and in fact, I think that uh, central banks around the world, and of course then there's the risks associated with the centralization of a central bank digital currency, but I think central banks of world, around the world don't want to be left behind in their own competition for creating a central bank digital currency, which becomes dominant. And so I think you're going to see a number of different things happening, and that's why I think the United States in particular needs to get ahead of the game, at least in terms of identifying the regulatory framework, making sure it's not unwieldy, but making sure that it provides some predictability so that people can move forward with their particular projects. Thank you. I'm going to pass the mic over. Thank you. Um, this is a question I've kind of been wrestling with a bit. Uh, obviously, you know, Bitcoin is sound money in the sense that, you know, it, it's a limited supply. Uh, we think of gold-backed uh, currencies as being sound because there's a limited supply of gold as well. Um, thinking, and this doesn't apply to Bitcoin, but uh, gold in particular, we have, um, I, I think it was in the past year, there was in Uganda, they had discovered some gold mine that had um, so many tons of, raw gold and, and they've estimated the value of uh, refined gold they could get. Um, I, I guess I, I don't quite understand, and maybe you can speak about this, uh, if gold is such a sound 
money system, but we then discovered we actually had twice as much gold. You know, all of our gold-backed things are half as valuable. Um, I, I don't know if this question makes sense. Or no, I, no, no think I think I know this? where you're going. Yep. So, you know, gold itself through history has shown to have a very, very low ratio of new discoveries relative to the current stock. And so that of itself has proved to be durable over time. I don't know. There could be, I suppose, <coughs> geologists would know better than I what the potential is for new discoveries relative to the current stock. Uh, but that has historically been the reason why it's been considered to be a sound anchor for any particular uh, monetary regime. Um, Bitcoin, as I understand it, of course, I don't understand the algorithm, but I understand that it is algorithmically limited. Like, there's just no way that it's ever going to change, and you're going to sort of asymptotically reproach that limit with the final Bitcoin, what, maybe 150 years or so being mined. And so there, once again, you have the, the manifestations of characteristics of gold with the added benefit that you don't have to physically transfer anything, right? I mean, there actually was a time when the French president sent a major frigate over to the United States to retrieve a bunch of gold from Fort Knox. And so obviously that's quite cumbersome, uh, but it does sound to me that Bitcoin, as an example, would have all the, all the qualities of gold and then the added benefit of not requiring a material form. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephen Barris. Can uh, we have a round of applause? We are